So we are living in a century where the basic science and engineering discoveries happening right now are shaping the regenerative medicine therapies of the future. So let me share with you some insights that we're getting from analysis of reptiles that very much shape what we think will be these therapies of the future. So you could ask, what is biological regeneration? Well, it's defined as the regrowth of a body part or organ you know, that restores the functionality of that part. And it typically involves a complex structure with multiple uh, cell types, you know, such as nerves, uh, muscle, blood vessels, and skin. And it's very distinct from the process of repair. So repair is usually just involves one or two cell types and sometimes can even lead to a process of scarring. So not really replacement, but really something that just patches over things. And on the right side, you'll see a pinnacle of example of regeneration. So salamanders can lose their forelimbs or their hind limbs, and then they actually can grow back at almost nearly identical replacement, truly regenerating what was lost. You know, you could ask yourself, so how common is this? So we are, um, you know, part of a group of animals that have backbones called vertebrates. And you could see, like, well, how common is regeneration in the vertebrate tree of life? And the answer is actually it's pretty common. So um, let's start from the more distantly related, you know, uh, members of the, uh, of the vertebrates. So that group of animals is called anamniotes and they primarily live in the water. So examples are like the salamander we just saw, and also fish. And they actually can exhibit something called identicals or perfect regeneration. So the part is pretty much exactly what was lost. In frogs, you see something a little bit more complicated where as younger animals, they can regrow pretty much exactly identical regeneration. But in adults, they actually don't re recreate the part exactly. So it's non-identical regeneration. Now, the group of animals that we belong to, invertebrates, are called the amniotes. And the amniotes have evolved to live on land. And when we look at amniotes that can regenerate, like reptiles, like alligators and lizards that we've studied, they are able to carry out nine identical regenerations. So the parts that regrow replace what was lost, but they're not exactly the same. So you know, that gives us a bit of a window into what might be happening or capable of happening in us as humans. So we are you know, a member of am amniotes called mammals. And so mammals, we got the short end of the stick and we actually are not very good at regenerating. Um, we have very limited ability, but because all of our vertebrate tree of life cousins can, you know, that actually raises hope um, about what can we you know, reactivate in us. So what can we find out looking at reptiles and what th they can do? Because they actually are the most closely related uh, vertebrates to us that actually regenerate really well. So we've been doing studies on the green animal lizard on the left, and we chose that because it has a, a whole genome, a whole set of genetic instructions that have been decoded. So we can look at that entire genetic sort of book of life and figure out, okay, well, what might be involved? And then um, the you know, lizards are able to lose their um, original tail, and then you know, that regrows, and you can see, you know, why, so they've evolved the ability to lose their tail. What's, what's good about that? Well, it wiggles, it distracts the predator, like your cats may have like, tried to grab a tail. The lizard you know, runs off and survives to another day. But interestingly, um, the regenerated tail can also wiggle, and it does replace that function of distracting the predator. Now, what's interesting is that the original tail is structured very differently than the regenerated tail. The original tail consists of segments of bone and cartilage and muscles, nerves, and you know, it has actually slightly different motion if you look at it. It's more sort of S-shaped or, or snake-like. The regenerated tail actually consists of just one long section of a cartilage, you know, a cartilage tube that then is bent by these long muscles. So on the outside, it looks pretty similar, but on the inside, it's actually a good example of non-identical regeneration. So what we've done is been taken advantage of the fact that we have all the genes you know, decoded in these lizards to look both at different stages in this process and also in different places in the regenerating tail. And what strikes us is that there are certain patterns that you see when you look at all 20,000 of the genes that are found in the lizard genome. So one class of cells, that, I mean, a class of genes that we find are those involved in stem cells. So these are cells that are capable of making multiple different types of tissues, as well as reforming tissues. And it, we saw that particularly a little bit later in regeneration and especially towards the base of this regenerating tail. 
The other group actually we saw very early, really early in the process of regeneration, and actually also towards the tip of the growing tail. And those are genes that control the immune system. And that actually is gonna be really important for what, what I'll talk to you about next. So this overview basically kind of is the, one of the first of three, I think, parts about what will be involved in the recipe to reactivate regeneration or activate regeneration in humans. So regeneration is a response to injury. I mean, we've heard there's all kinds of injuries that we suffer, but then pretty soon on, there's an immune response. Either it gets red and hot and inflamed, or it doesn't. And that immune response for, a, say, if you lose a limb or a tail, you need to close that up and, and, and close up the wound because you might get infected. And then if you do set off certain kinds of reactions like inflammation, you start a process called fibrosis and that leads to scars. And I think we all have scars in our body. And the scars aren't as good as the original tissue, but it's better than having an open wound. Or if you have a heart attack and this muscle turns into scar tissue, it doesn't you know, you know, beat and contract like the original muscle, but it still prevents then a hole opening up in your heart. So, and actually in lizards, actually, if you, they lose a limb, what happens is it looks like it's starting to try to regrow, but then it pretty much immediately again goes into becoming a scar tissue. So if you have the right kind of immune response that you sort of suppress that scarring process and you allow those stem cells to get reactivated and, you know, lead the process of regeneration, then you can actually then get, truly get a replacement of that part. So this kind of decision about which path on this tree that you go down is really critical and really decided by the immune system. So what happens early on in the post-injury period makes a big difference of what might happen to the process next. So the second part I think that is you know, clear from studies that we've done is that Regeneration, you know, is, is, you know, there's a reason why we as mammals don't regenerate as well. So we looked at a certain type of stem cell that in, in us, in mammals, uh, make uh, muscle. So if you go to the gym and work out, you know, these cells, you know, help the muscle to bulk up. So they're called satellite cells. And they express certain genes on their surface. So normally if you take those out and you put them in a Petri dish and you culture them, they can make muscle. Now, what's interesting that if you go to the lizard and look for exactly the same kinds of cells that look exactly the same and express the same things on their surfaces, they actually not only make muscle, which is kind of what you would expect, but they actually make cartilage too. And that's surprising because in us, you know, our satellite cells can't make cartilage. And when you go and look at what genes are on in these cells, what it looks like is they're particularly really high levels of a gene family called BMPs. And BMPs really are important in activating cartilage formation. So essentially, the lizards are already sort of naturally primed to make both muscle and cartilage. So we're not naturally primed to make muscle and cartilage. So if we wanted our cells, for example, if these satellite cells to be more flexible and more capable, we would need to take advantage of genetic engineering technologies that exist now that we can take cells, reprogram them, and they actually can then express different genes. And so and it would be, need to be our cells, so, so they would be recognized by our body as ours. But that's within the realm of possibility now that we're starting to get a good sense of what genes need to be on or off. Now, we're big animals. Um, lizards are really small. You know, alligators, which we've studied, are bigger. But you know, if we're to replace an entire leg or arm, that's not very easy. So we're not only going to need genetic reprogrammed stem cells, but we're also going to need to take advantage of the best of bioengineering married with this genetic technology. So scientists right now and engineers are working on these 3D printers, which actually then can combine high-tech materials and actually lay down and print you know, tissues and cells and create structures that we couldn't create that, you know, that are just too big. So given how big we are and how big our organs are, it's likely that we're gonna to have to marry engineering technologies plus these you know, sort of genetically programmed, reprogrammed cells in order to make the, uh, the, the structures that we're gonna to need to replace. So that's the third part. So you know, these are three pieces that we already see that are gonna be important. You know, the first is you know, understanding like, what are we capable of doing in terms of regeneration you know, and the genes involved. The second is the, the need to genetically reprogram these cells. And the third is you know, something that's still very much in works. It might take decades to perfect. You know, after all, you can't just hit a button and 3D print a limb, right? So this might you know, be the work of many decades of activation to be carefully creating the right structures. But why do we need this to work? Well, 
we are, have so many critical organs that we're not able to regenerate. Our lungs, our brain and spinal cord, our kidneys. I mean, most of our organs, we cannot regrow them. And you know, this has led to tremendous suffering and illness. You know, and many of you may have family members or people you know that are really suffering because you know, their organs have failed or organs are damaged. Also, even more simply, so to speak, you, know, you probably know a lot of people that have arthritis, osteoarthritis, and the, you know, the tissue that's in the joints is relatively simple. It's articular cartilage. And the lizards, when they regrow they their tails, they grow lots of that. I mean, they can just do that really easily. So even you know, understanding, well, why are, how, how are the lizards able to regrow this cartilage that would just you know, make our joints work so much better would be a huge advance. And of course, you know, you know, we you know, as humans have limited lifespans. So the oldest human being alive right now is Kane Tanaka, and she is 118 years old, and that's old. But I think there are people probably in this audience right now that would like to live to 150 or 200, and we're not gonna get there naturally, right? So how do we do that? Well, we know that our organs wear out. They're not going to last that long, but if we're able to replace them, if we're able to repair damaged brain tissue or you know, damaged heart tissue, then we actually potentially extend our lifespan. So you know, this is really you know, kind of an amazing possible future given that we are just amongst, in the vertebrate tree of life, one of the few animals that doesn't really regenerate very well so that our, our, you know, our relatives actually do, and we still have pretty much the same genes. So there's this great potential to be able to combine all that together. So in closing, you know, the youngest amongst us today live in a time that the basic science discovery is happening right now. You, know, you can see the future of possible regenerative therapies, and this will happen this century, and this will be the crowning biomedical achievement of this century. Thank you.